I'm so glad that you've tuned in to one of the sermons from St Mary's. If you're new to our church and would like to find out more about being involved, please visit our website and drop us a line. We'd love to hear from you. While Jesus was still speaking to the crowds, his mother and his brothers were standing outside, wanting to speak to him. Someone told him, look, your mother and your brothers are standing outside, wanting to speak to you. But to the one who told him this, Jesus replied, who is my mother? And who are my brothers? And pointing to his disciples, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. This is the word of the Lord. The second reading is taken from John chapter 19, verses 25 to 27. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Madeline. When Jesus saw his mother, and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, woman, here is your son. And, when he, and then he said to the disciple, here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. This is the word of the Lord. Great, thank you, sir. Mike and sir Josh for reading for us. Uh, if you're able to, can I uh, ask you to stand with me? Uh, when Jesus prayed with his friends uh, in the Bible, uh, he would have uh, invited them to stand. And so we're just going to do that for a minute or so now. Let's pray together. Uh, Lord Jesus, we thank you uh, that the words that we've heard from the Bible were words that you spoke. Uh, thank you that you spoke them to specific people in history. And so thank you that as we look at the Bible this morning, uh, we're not looking at words that were written about you or um, uh, words that are somebody else's invention. We, we thank you that we're listening to words that you spoke. And so we pray that you'd help us to hear with ears that are opened by you, to hear not just physically, uh, but to hear spiritually as well. In your name we pray. Amen. Great, lovely. Do have a seat. And if you'd like to follow the passages through this morning, there'll be a Bible to hand just uh, near you. And it's page 118 towards the back of the Bibles that we're going to be looking at first of all. Page 118. Uh, and slightly confusingly, the numbers start again when you get to the New Testament. And so that's towards the back uh, of our Bibles. Uh, we're continuing, as Gemma mentioned this morning, our sermon series looking at getting on well. We're looking at the whole realm of human relationships. And this morning, we're looking at the theme of being single. Uh, and as I was preparing to write this sermon, uh, just as if kind of as if it was ordained, a kind of an email dropped in to my inbox. And it was an email, because sounds very exciting saying it was an email from the Archbishop of Canterbury, uh, but it was, it, it was an email from the Church of England about a register of ministers. It was one of those kind of standard HR forms, and you, you sort of know the deal with them. You needed to put down your name and your address and your date of birth and your qualifications and your background. Uh, and then I got through to the, the eight definitions that I could pick from to describe my marital status. Well, my marital status is single, so I put down single. And then later on in the form, it encouraged me to talk about my family. And appropriately and naturally enough, there was a position there to put in the name of my spouse. 
and to put in the name of any children. And it got me thinking at that point, clearly from an HR perspective, here was a very natural and normal question. Clearly, from a legal point of view, from a next of kin point of view, from a financial point of view, from lots of different angles, it was a very appropriate and a very natural question to ask. But it did get me thinking about just sometimes how narrow our definitions are. For me, when it asked me to talk about my family, that form didn't allow me to celebrate or to talk about the fullness of how I understand the word family. What we're going to do this morning through these passages is to consider what is normal, inverted commas. We're going to consider how we define ourselves, however that might be, whether we would consider ourselves to be married or single or however else we might define ourselves. And we're going to consider how whatever we choose or however we choose to define ourselves All of that is designed to point to God. So first of all, let's get stuck in with John chapter 19 and some of Jesus's final words from the cross. And the first thing that we notice when the Bible talks about marriage and when the Bible talks about singleness, when it talks about things like financial provision and next of kin and legalities and all of those types of things, The Bible has an essentially pragmatic and a deeply normal view of life. It was God who set up marriage between Adam and Eve in the Old Testament as one of the key foundations of our society. But equally, it's also God, as we look through the Old Testament, who recognizes that at any one moment in time, and for a whole variety of reasons, there will be lots of people who find themselves single. And he loves married people, and he loves single people, and he wants to provide and support for us all, both financially and legally and practically, as well as spiritually. In the gospel accounts of Jesus's life, Joseph disappears from the scene relatively early on. Uh, Most commentators think that Joseph died relatively early on in Jesus's life, and so Mary was a lone parent bringing up Jesus and bringing up his brothers. And so at the point of his own death, Jesus honours his lone parent mum and his brothers with some of his final words. And so We read in verse 26 of John 19 this, when Jesus saw his mother and the disciple he loved, that's John, the person who's writing the gospel here, when Jesus saw his mother and John standing beside her, he said to his mother, woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own house. Uh, in, in Bible times, the, the last words of somebody had legal validity. This is Jesus's, in earthly terms, this is Jesus's last will and testament. The thing that he wants practically, the thing that he wants in terms of his kind of inheritance, next of kin, all of those types of things, is just very normal, very practical, very everyday. He wants to look after his mum and make sure that she's provided for. It's very honouring to everyone in the story. It's good to remind ourselves what normal is. In normal, everyday terms, singleness, as well as marriage, is perfectly normal. Society can often assume that marriage with 1.7 children is normal. Uh, Let me assure you, there is no family in the UK where there is a marriage with 1.7 children. Uh, In 2019... 8.2 million people living in the UK lived alone, and the majority weren't in old age. The majority were aged somewhere between 16 and 64. A further 2.9 million people were living as lone parents. 
Uh, of the eight definitions that my Church of England form allowed me to express my marital status, three of them would be legally considered as expressing singleness, not just the category single. Uh, Jesus and the Bible celebrate marriage, and they also recognise that it can be normal to be single too. Uh, whether that singleness is a result of calling or vocation or a deep sense of identity, uh, whether it's through force of any one of a number of life circumstances, whether it's due to separation or divorce or death, whether it feels like a choice or an imposition, whether it feels like a transitory state or a permanent state, singleness is acknowledged as an important part of the fabric of society in the same way as marriage. Uh, Jesus was single, and his identity, including his singleness, is something that the Bible celebrates. Jesus, a single man, looks out from the cross on his lone parent mum, and he acknowledged that her situation and his situation, as well as the situations of the married people around him, were far from abnormal. He provided financially, he provided practically, but he also provided emotionally and spiritually as, as well. He understood that although at any one point many will be single, no one needs to be alone. No one needs to write on their form, I have no family. I wonder what that uh, looks like for you and what it looks like for me. Uh, I wonder what it looks like uh, to uh, invite others perhaps to share your family. We've had a great kind of visual demonstration this morning of uh, a biological family. It's, all, it's, it's lovely as well to see Mike and Josh reading for us this morning. I wonder what it means to invite people to become part of your family. I equally wonder what it means to allow yourself to be invited into somebody else's family and not just the normal bits, but the kind of the messy bits and the kind of the bits that make families families and make you feel part of the furniture. Uh, Jesus' words and example have uh, led us to a, a second point. Uh, we've seen that uh, Jesus acknowledges the, the normalness of both marriage and singleness as part of normal society. Uh, but Jesus takes sometimes society's narrow norms and he kind of expands them in a really exciting way. He kind of gives them a sense of fullness, a sense of kind of greatness that sometimes society tends to kind of try to narrow down. Let's just have a look what we mean. See, because in Jesus's world, the word single does not mean alone. Just allow Jesus to redefine this word single. In Jesus's economy, the word single means one with other people. The word single means part of others. The word single means together with others. And in God's kingdom, the words mother and father or mum and dad, brother, sister, son, daughter, they're not just narrow biological terms with practical implications. They're not just legal HR terms with practical implications. They're really wide spiritual terms with really exciting practical implications as well. Jesus redefines the narrow norms of John and Mary's words. When he looks out from the cross, he says to Mary, this is your son. It must blow Mary's mind. So suddenly she's, she's got a son she never knew she had. Here's John, who's got a mother who he never really realized that he had. John, here is your mother. And that helps us to understand perhaps Matthew 12 Verse 48, which Mike read for us so helpfully earlier. Who is my mother 
and my brothers, Jesus said, and pointing to his disciples, he said, here is my mother, here are my brothers. It's what we said during the baptism service just now. Gemma looked at all of us and said, brothers and sisters, I invite you all to declare your faith. And we, and we said the words of the creed together. There is a sense in which we are brothers and sisters in Christ together. It's not as if Jesus is calling the nuclear family in any way unimportant. He's already showed in his words to Mary and his care for her from the cross that he considers nuclear family to be really important. But I wonder how his enlarged definition of family might present us with, with, with challenges as well. As we, as we look around folk here this morning, there'll be things that delight and bring us great joy, but there'll be things that irritate us as well, just like any family. But I wonder how Jesus' redefinition of family enables that to take a fullness and the fullness of God's kingdom, that the eyes of the embrace of God, the arms, sorry, of the embrace of God go wide and talk about the fullness of how God looks at this family that he's created. Finally, uh, in our thoughts on these two passages, Jesus reminds us of a key truth of the universe. He reminds us that as creator, God sets up the world of definitions and names and identities. And he set it up to point to him who is at the center of things. Everything in creation, it makes logical sense, everything in creation is defined in relation to its creator. Jesus says in verse 30 of Matthew 12, for whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. Jesus, in all of his teaching and ministry, points us to God, his Father. He reminds us that the family of creation is centered on God. That doesn't make me less myself if I point more towards God than to me. In fact, if anything, it makes me more myself. We love people, don't we, who are selfless. We're taught in school that, it, that it's better to give stuff than to receive and hoard it to myself. We remember those who put others first. Uh, we celebrate people who give themselves away or give their time or their money away. That's how God has set things up. He set it up to say that our identity isn't, isn't unimportant, but actually we're designed to point to God and to point to others. That's why Jesus, when he was asked, what's the greatest commandment? He said, love God and love others. One commentator once said, people wrapped up in themselves make very small packages. So as we land, it, it's worth just mentioning and being very clear that a sermon on singleness is not about me or about how I define myself on an HR form from the C of E. Uh, so much of the current identity debate focuses on me, who I feel I am, how I choose to define myself in the hit tune from The Greatest Showman, the national anthem might almost be, this is me. And it's true that God loves me. It's true that God cherishes me. It's true that my identity to him is really important. But it's also true that he created me to find my ultimate identity in my relationship with him 
not to find my identity ultimately in myself and by myself. The Christian identity debate begins with God. It begins with who he said he is, how he invites me to define myself in relation to him through Jesus and to find the fullness of who I am in Christ alone. And that's what I love about my parents, my uh, biological family. Uh, it's what I also love about Claire and Andy uh, and their kids, Jemima, Moses and Hannah. Uh, it's what I love about John and Meg and little baby Finn. Uh, it's what I love about Pete, who I used to teach when I was uh, a French teacher and his family. It's what I love about Rob and his family. It's what I love about Clem and Bethany. It's what I love about Steve and Jan. It's what I love about Leslie. It's what I love about Jill. It's what I love about the whole family. It's what I love about the Gandon family. Uh, these are the people who make me feel like part of their family furniture. Uh, they're the people that I can just drop in on and who can drop in on me. Uh, they're the people who invite me to do their washing up rather than just pack me off at the end of dinner and say, don't worry, leave it to us. Uh, they're the people I go on family holidays with. They're the people I take to the beach. They're the people I cook with. Uh, they're the people who WhatsApped the moment that lockdown was announced. It was almost rather overwhelming, all of these WhatsApps coming in. Um, but then as we settled down and we realised we couldn't spend evenings together in person, they're the people who sent me a bottle of wine and cheese and DVDs in the post so that we could sort of have a virtual evening together. Uh, they're the people who offer very practical love. Uh, but more than that, they're people who are brothers and sisters and mothers and fathers and sons and daughters to me in the family of Christ. They're people who point me towards Jesus in what they do and say and think. And hopefully I point them to Jesus as well. And they remind me that whilst family is my biological nuclear family, it's also much wider than that, that my identity is ultimately found together with them through Christ in my Father in heaven, in whom everything lives and moves and has its being. We're going to go on uh, with the rest of our service now, but as we go through this series on uh, getting on well on our relationships, uh, it's more than possible that a number of us will resonate with various things that we're looking at in different ways. It's good for the church to be talking about these types of things, but if you would like to talk more than is possible in this type of atmosphere, with anybody on the church staff team, if anything's come up for you today uh, or in any of our other sermons, then please do get in contact with either the church office, Rachel or Carrie. Actually, Rachel, Carrie, can you just wave just so that people can see who they're contacting? Rachel and Carrie in the church office would love to receive your email and put it in one of our directions or get in contact with us directly as members of the staff team. God bless you.